Israel has, as we all know and recognise, a central position in God's plan. The prophets of old, and going right back into the record of Deuteronomy, tells us that the land and the people hold a special position in the eyes of God. The land we read in Deuteronomy 11, whither ye go to possess it, is a land of hills and valleys, and drinketh water of the rain of heaven, a land which Yahweh thy God careth for. The eyes of Yahweh thy God are always upon it from the beginning of the year even unto the end of the year. The Messiah, brethren and sisters, reigns in the land of Israel. It is the first dominion of the kingdom. And so if we ask ourselves the question, Israel ready for their Messiah? Well, the first part of the answer to that must be that for the Messiah to be there, there must be a country and a people by the name of Israel in order that he can take his place as their rightful ruler and then spread there, from there to the rest of the world. And so not only is Israel central to God's plan in terms of the nation and the people, but all, well, also uh, not just the land, but also the people, as this verse tells us, these verses from Jeremiah chapter 31, Thus says Yahweh, who gives the sun for a light by day and the fixed order of the moon and the stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar. Yahweh of armies is his name. If this fixed order departs from before me, declares Yahweh, then the offspring of Israel also will cease from being a nation before me forever. So we know that God has had a purpose with his people. 200 years ago, people would have looked and scoffed at prophecies about a nation of Israel, for there was no country in the world, and the people were scattered here and there across the world. But we know that God's purpose required that Israel come into existence and come into existence they did. It's not our purpose to trace that, but it's an amazing and incredible thing and so powerful for us. We believe, don't we, brethren and sisters, young people and friends, that the nation of Israel is the greatest sign to the world in the latter days. Not only a sign that God has a purpose, but that he exists and that the, the purpose of God in bringing their Messiah back to reign over them as king is advancing towards its fulfilment. And so the wonderful words of Psalm 102 tell us, But thou, O Yahweh, shall endure forever and thy remembrance unto all generations. Thou shalt arise and have mercy upon Zion for the time to favour her, yea, the set time is come. For thy servants take pleasure in her stones and favour the dust thereof. So the heathen shall fear the name of Yahweh and all the kings of the earth thy glory. When Yahweh shall build up Zion, he shall appear in his glory. And since the inception of our community, brethren and sisters, we have always regarded our hope as the hope of Israel. And we, as a community, have favoured the dust of that place. We, as a community, supported the restoration, the re-establishment, the resettlement of the Jews. As a community, historically, Christadelphians put their hands in their pocket and supported organisations like Youth Aliyah, which were encouraging the return and the resettlement of Jews back into the land. Perhaps we need to examine ourselves in these last days to ask ourselves, how is our support for that remarkable testimony of Bible prophecy? Because it is the greatest sign in these modern days for us that God exists and that his purpose is coming to fruition.
These are words that many of us will know pretty much by heart, brethren and sisters. Brother Thomas was not a prophet. We know he wasn't inspired by God. So what allowed him to write these words that are so remarkably accurate? He was a good Bible student, brethren and sisters, and as our brother Frank has said, how important it is for every one of us to open our Bibles and to study them. Let's read these words together. He wrote, There is then a partial and primary restoration of the Jews before the manifestation, in other words, before the return of Christ, which is to serve as the nucleus or basis of, of future operations in the restoration of the rest of the times, the tribes after he has appeared in the kingdom. The pre-adventual colonisation of Palestine will be on purely political principles and the Jewish colonists will return in unbelief of the Messiahship of Jesus and of the truth as it is in him. They will emigrate thither as agriculturists and traders in the hope of ultimately establishing their commonwealth, but more immediately of getting rich in silver and gold. And of course, those last words come from the reading that we had this afternoon from Ezekiel chapter 38. We'll have a little more to say about that in a minute. But the rebirth of the nation, brethren and sisters, there would be very few of us now in this room who were alive at the time when Israel became a nation again. But to those who were alive at that time, it is no doubt indelibly impressed in their minds. But for us, it is a matter of history that Israel became a nation again and fulfilled so many Old Testament prophecies, including, as we read from Ezekiel chapter 38 today, But I've got a few verses on the screen there from Ezekiel 37. That wonderful prophecy of the Valley of Dry Bones that so remarkably describes Israel's situation before and after the beginning of the regathering. And so Ezekiel was inspired to write, Then he said unto me, me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried and our hope is lost. We are cut off for our parts. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord Yahweh, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. What a remarkable set of circumstances came together to cause that to come to pass. And so Israel was reborn, and they were reborn in turbulent times. The United Nations drew up a plan to partition the land, and a majority of nations voted in favour of the plan, but it was never implemented because as soon as Israel was declared a nation, declared themselves a nation, it was invaded and attacked by all the surrounding nations. And their aim was to wipe Israel from the map. And again, we saw remarkable fulfillments of Bible prophecy because the psalmist wrote of these things in Psalm 80, where we get a bit of a feel for the, the strength of the antagonism of these peoples to the very idea of the nation of Israel in their land again. Psalm 83 Keep not thou silent, O God, hold not thy peace, and be not still, O God, for lo, thine enemies make a tumult, and they that hate thee have lifted up the head. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people and consulted against thy hidden ones. They have said, Come and let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. For they have consulted together with one consent. They are confederate against thee the tabernacles of Edom and the Ishmaelites, of Moab and the Hagarenes, Gebel and Ammon and Amalek, the Philistines with the inhabitants of Tyre. Asher also is joined with them. They have holpen the children of Lot. A remarkable set of verses, brothers and sisters, and it's a matter of history that those things have come to pass in that incredible 
animosity and hatred that was poured out at that time and subsequent to that time as repeatedly there have been wars against that fledgling nation as it came into existence. And of course, that war came to be known as the War of Independence and the outcome was humiliation for Israel's enemies. And moving forward, of course, another momentous occurrence in 1967 and a lot more of us were alive in in that year. I was alive um, and I remember it. I was 11 years old and it, it, that particular uh, week of history, just under a week, is absolutely indelibly etched in my mind. And I remember the absolute electric excitement that was in the ecclesias at that time because we were seeing Bible prophecy alive before our eyes and particularly as Israel took uh, full control of the city of Jerusalem and we saw more of the words of the Bible coming to pass. As Jesus wrote, uh, said in Luke 21, "'They shall fall by the edge of the sword "'and shall be led away captive into all nations.'" Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And again in Joel chapter 3, he says, In those days and at that time when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. And of course that's precisely what happened. That Jerusalem came under Jewish control uh, after the rest of the land was Inhabited and, and the nation of Israel existed. So it was another sign to us, brethren and sisters. It was a sign that God was at work and his purpose was steadily, inexorably moving towards its climax. We need to ask ourselves, do we still have the same enthusiasm as we did in those days? Possibly not. And yet there's probably more signs today than there were in those days. And those of us who were not alive in those days, let's all remember the amazing witness of these fulfilled prophecies. Subsequent to that time, there have been further wars and a number of peace concessions so that the borders of Israel have changed. They've expanded and then contracted as Israel has given away a number of tracts of territory. But one thing has remained the same. There has been amazing hostility to God's people. And Netanyahu said it nicely in 2006 when he said, the truth is that if Israel were to put down its arms, there would be no more Israel. If the Arabs were to put down their arms, there would be no more war. But it wasn't to be. Another quote from Iran's Khamenei in 2014, one of many that we could have picked. This barbaric, wolf-like and infanticidal regime of Israel, which spares no crime, has no cure but to be annihilated. And so that amazing hostility has continued from many quarters against the people of God. And what we have seen over a period of time is a series of conflicts And at every moment, at every opportunity, Israel has reached out. They seek peace. They can't get peace. There have been progressive, uh, there has been progress, of course, with peace. A number of significant things have occurred. Uh, One of the earliest of them, of course, was in uh, 1977-78 when the Egyptian president, Sadat, visited Jerusalem, recognised Israel as an independent state and in 78 uh, the Camp David Accords were signed by Anwar Sadat and Menahem Begin. Uh, Quite a remarkable um, step forward. And of course um, went on to, in 1979 to draft a full agreement where the Sinai was returned to Egypt and there has remained under their control to this day. We could perhaps dispute whether it's actually under their control at this very moment uh, because of the terrorist moves. 
but a remarkable prophecy in it, a fulfilment of uh, prophecy in itself, which we'll look at in a minute. And of course, over time, another amazing development took place, and that was when um, Yasser Arafat agreed to make peace concessions uh, and a peace deal with Israel to recognise their existence. But it still hasn't been easy, and we've seen, of course, since that time, um, Gaza becoming uh, independent, Israel withdrawing from Gaza and uh, not directly ruling in, in there at all anymore. And of course what has happened is that Hamas have gained superiority and in their implacable hatred have cast fire and brimstone of their rockets against Israel. So it's been a series of, of conflicts and peace moves. Peace, Israel always seeking peace, but finding hatred from their enemies. And Bible prophecy does depict this strange mixture of hostility of other nations against Israel, but also confidence in their own security and strength. And a couple of references here up on the screen. Firstly, from Ezekiel 38. Thou shalt say, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages. I will go to them that are at rest, that dwell safely. And the Hebrew word can be translated confidently. All of them dwelling without walls, having neither bars nor gates. Now, of course, brethren and sisters, we don't know how far Israel will go towards increasing that confidence. They've built this uh, phenomenal uh, wall, which I'll just flick forward to, um, around much of the West Bank that uh, separates the, them from many of the, the potential terrorists that would like to enter Israel. And we might say, well, um, are they, uh, that's a pretty big wall. So what does it mean here in Ezekiel 38 where it says, uh, all of them dwelling without walls? Well, certainly there are big walls there, but the, the wall is actually surrounding the, the Israelites and the Israelites themselves, of course, derive a great deal of security from the presence of that wall. And within that section, they are a lot safer than they were. Certainly the amount of suicide bombers, etc., has greatly re reduced. Who knows whether there will be a greater period of peace before our Lord returns or not. It's difficult to say. But there is a very interesting aspect to this that I thought, thought was worth talking about, and that is the, the phrase that's used uh, even in Ezekiel chapter 38, the mountains of Israel. So in Ezekiel 38 we read, After many days thou shalt be visited in the latter years, thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword, is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel. Now you know if you have a look at the, the map of Israel, the the, the central portion of Israel today, it basically breaks up geographically into a small number of regions. In the south, you've got this area of desert, mostly desert here, that is called the Negev. Up the west coast here, you've got the coastal plain, the Shafila. Down the centre, on the east boundary, you've got the Jordan Valley. And right in the middle here, you've got what we would call, or is called here on the map, the Judean Hills. I don't think there's any doubt, brethren and sisters, that that area of the land is what is referred to here by the prophet as the mountains of Israel. And so we can be pretty confident, brethren and sisters, that the mountains of Israel, which are, of course, one of the, the areas in most hot dispute at the moment, commonly called the West Bank, is going to remain under Israeli control. And Netanyahu has, has basically sworn on his life that that will be the case so long as he lives, uh, even in recent times. Uh, we know, of course, that there's a huge amount of, of uh, conflict and, and a lot of pressure on Israel uh, internationally because of the fact that they have built many, many settlements in the West Bank because they believe fervently that it is their country. And, of course, we also believe that that is the case. Also out of Ezekiel 38, where it says here, 
um, that dwell in the midst of the land. And I've made a note there at the bottom that the word midst there means to pile up, that is by implication a summit. And again, it's further evidence that Israel at the time of Gog's invasion will be dwelling in that central area of the land. It's absolutely vital to them and to their security. Well, Israel is a very tiny nation, however, incredibly significant. I've just overlaid Israel there on a map of southwest of Western Australia, just so you can get a bit of an idea. There's Perth, there's Albany. And from north to south, Israel is almost exactly the same distance as the distance of Perth to Albany. So it just shows you how, what a relatively tiny country it is. And yet, what an amazing country in the eyes of God and in terms of its impact on the nations. You know, Israel today is a pretty prosperous country. It's a country where close to 50% of the Jews throughout the world now live, 40-something percent. Latest uh, population statistics I could find, 8.3 million, 8.37 million, of which around 75% are Jewish, 20% are Arab, and about 5% are other nationalities. Interestingly, a recent Gallup survey determined that of the Israelis in the land, something like two-thirds say that they are not religious or atheists, and about a third say that they are religious. And also, interestingly, about 75% of the current Jewish population was actually born in Israel. So quite a significant number. We're reminded with the, uh, the statistics on the religion there, although I'm absolutely sure that um, it's not the same demographic, of the terrible words of Zechariah chapter 13 and verses 8 and 9 where the prophet says it shall come to pass that in all the land saith Yahweh two parts therein shall be cut off and die but the third part third shall be left therein and I will bring the third part through the fire and will refine them as silver is refined and will try them as gold is tried they shall call on my name and I will hear them I will say it is my people and they shall say Yahweh is my God. We can just only imagine, brethren and sisters, out of a population of 8.3 million, two-thirds are dying. That's a huge death toll, isn't it? That is a colossal tragedy. And yet it is something that we know, sadly, has to come to pass in order that Israel might be humbled and accept their Messiah. Well, Israel economically is mentioned in the Bible. And if we go again to Ezekiel chapter 38, in verse 13, Gog is asked, Art thou come to take a spoil? Hast thou gathered thy company to take a prey, to carry away silver and gold, to take away cattle and goods, to take a great spoil? And it's interesting that the word uh, cattle there actually has the idea of something bought and goods, an acquisition, a purchase or wealth. And it's from a word meaning creation. And I thought that was quite interesting because Israel's economy is strong not only in producing and trading, uh, as in buying and selling materials, but also creating and selling, uh, creating new ideas, new technologies. Israel is sometimes called the startup nation because they have such a phenomenal drive to create business and wealth for themselves. They are, in many senses, a technologically advanced country and many uh, inventions and innovations trace their origin to that tiny nation, far above its per capita uh, impact upon the world. Israel's economy is boosted by uh, new technologies it has the OECD's highest gross expenditure on research and development as a percentage of GSP, GDP, the largest amount of companies listed on the NASDAQ outside of North America, the highest level of venture capital as a share of GDP. It leads the world in the number of scientists and technicians in the workforce um, with 145 per 10,000 as opposed to 85 in the US. Over 25% of its workforce is employed in technical professions. 
Israel has the highest per capita ratio of scientific publications in the world, the highest, one of the highest per capita rates of patents filed. It's second in the world for percent of population with university degrees. Brother Frank will be pleased to know that Canada is number one. Um, but 45% of their population with university degrees, that's quite extraordinary. And of course, in recent times, a massive potential boost to Israel's economy has come from the discovery of enormous gas reserves off the west coast of Israel in the Mediterranean. And with that, of course, they have a historic chance of energy independence. And not only that, but they've already been working hard on negotiating a, an agreement with Jordan to supply them with gas, and they're even talking possible pipeline through to Europe. Uh, as I said, they're certainly uh, an enterprising people. And yet, in all of that, they are finding that people are closing doors upon them, and they are struggling against unreasoning and unreasonable hatred and isolation. And we're reminded of um, that in the words of Isaiah 60 in verses 14 and 15, where writing in retrospect, I guess you could say, of the kingdom age, but looking back, it says, The sons also of them that afflicted thee shall come bending to thee. All they that despised thee shall bow themselves down at the soles of thy, thy feet. Whereas thou hast been forsaken and hated, so that no man went through thee, I will make thee an eternal excellency. So looking at the comparison, the words that are highlighted there, you can see that it describes Israel before Christ comes in those ways, that they are afflicted, despised, forsaken and hated. And certainly economically, for, uh, with some nations, that is becoming an increasing problem. There is a movement throughout the world that is sometimes um, summarised as BDS, Boycotts, divestment and sanctions. And those three are regarded as, as weapons, new weapons, economic weapons against Israel, rather like what has uh, uh, been applied by the US against Russia because of its uh, Ukraine invasion. But anti-Semitism, brethren and sisters, has been on the rise and certainly 2014 was the second worst year on record for anti-Semitic incidents, particularly in Europe. And because of that, uh, there has been a, a significant rise in emigration from Europe and into Israel. There has been a rise in what we might call, rather ghoulishly, classic anti-Semitism, that which has been around for centuries but there is also a rising threat which is uh, called by the rather lengthy term delegitimization. It's a subtle battle of the media where people are regarding Israel as not legitimately in the land and they regard them as the oppressors of the Palestinians and even compare them to South Africa, the apartheid regime uh, under South Africa in the past. This was an interesting article that just came up this week. Uh, the Uniting, United Church of Canada, that's a coincidence, uh, voted in favour of divestment from Israel during its 42nd council meet, general council meeting. To address, they said, the illegal occupation of Palestinian territories by the State of Israel. With more than two million members, it's the largest uh, of the Protestant churches in Canada. So you can see that this is significant and it's repeated in many, in many organisations around the world. And so Israel is under a, a, an economic threat, a potential economic threat because of that. It's rumoured that at the upcoming 70th General Assembly of the United Nations in September of this year, just a couple of weeks, there is likely to be a France-sponsored motion put on the formation, the formal acceptance of a Palestinian state. And uh, there's a lot of, of rumouring about what that Palestinian state is going to include. But if it is passed by the United Nations General Assembly, then 
um, there would be economic, there would be sanctions against Israel should she not comply with that. And so we are looking at a potential ramping up of international pressure against the nation of Israel. And as I said, not surprisingly, as a result of of increasing hostil- hostility, some of the terrorist acts in France and so on that have been particularly targeting uh, Israelis, uh, there's been a surge in immigration. Interestingly, the biggest surge has come from Ukraine, where often we don't necessarily hear about it, but anti-Semitism in war is a very real thing, and where most most normal laws that inhibit people's behaviour go out the window, and anti-Semitism is uh, doubly, triply a problem. So a very large increase in immigration to Israel. And we're reminded again of the Bible prophecies. Behold, I will bring them from the north country, gather them from the coasts of the earth, with them the blind and the lame, the woman with child and her that travaileth with child together. A great company shall return thither. They shall come with weeping and with supplications will I lead them. Netanyahu, at the, at the time of the recent terrorist attack in Paris, called on European Jews to immigrate to Israel, saying he would welcome them with open arms. There's something like half a million Jews in France at the moment, making it the second largest diaspora population uh, after the US. And some of them have taken the uh, opportunity and left. But again, we re- we're reminded that there are still the hunters and the fishers, brethren and sisters, And so Jeremiah wrote, Yahweh liveth that brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north and from all lands whither he had driven them. And I will bring them again into the land that I gave to their fathers. Behold, I will send for many fishers, saith Yahweh. So Netanyahu at the moment is acting as a fisher, inviting and encouraging the Jews to come back to the land. But the anti-Semitic persecutors of the Jews are still acting as hunters in order that God's purpose with his people and the preparation of a people for the Messiah may occur. Israel remains, brethren and sisters, a troubled land. Jerusalem remains a burdensome stone for all people. But we are encouraged by the fact that we know that we are living in the last days, in the times when these things will come to their final fulfilment. Interestingly, Pope Francis recently formally recognised the existence of the state of Palestine, and yet, of course, it actually doesn't exist. But there have been many nations that have um, already gone ahead to recognise a state of Palestine in order to increase pressure on Israel. But there's no doubt, brethren and sisters, that the Pope and his friends are eyeing Jerusalem and looking forward to the time when they can have it under their control as well. And we know that along with Russia and Europe, the papal authority will be adding their blessing to that invasion into the land. The continuing hostility with the Palestinians is practically a daily news item, isn't it? And yet... There are very clear references in the Bible that indicate that that should be the the case. In Joel chapter 3, it tells us that Palestine has a grudge against Israel. That's in the context of the latter days. Ezekiel 25 um, tells us that the Palestinians deal by revenge and seek to destroy Israel Quote, for the old hatred. Is that not a description of generational hatred that we see in those people where they teach their children from a young age to sing songs about the extermination of the people of Israel? Let's have a look at Isaiah chapter 14, verses 29 to 32. Rejoice not thou whole Palestina, because the rod of him that smote thee is broken, For out of the serpent's root shall come forth a cockatrice, and his fruit shall be a fiery flying serpent. 
And in recent times, I believe there is a latter-day application to this, brothers and sisters, because Israel has smitten the Palestinians and they will rejoice when they see Israel under the um, crushed by the, the Gogian host, but it won't last for very long at all because verse 31 says, Howl, O gate, cry, O city, thou whole Palestina are dissolved, for there shall come from the north a smoke and none shall be alone in his appointed times. What shall one then answer the messengers of the nation that Yahweh hath founded Zion and the poor of his people shall trust in it? So the, the anti-Zionist Palestinians will rejoice when they see Israel being crushed by Gog, but will in turn be annihilated by that mighty host. Well, there are also extremely interesting developments with Israel's southern neighbours, brethren and sisters, and this is er certainly an area that we need to watch. The, the rise of the threat of nu a nuclear Iran and also of uh, the terrorist group IS or ISIS um, it is changing the political map of the Middle East. It's extremely interesting that what we're finding is that Israel is developing a relationship with Saudi Arabia and with Egypt and with Jordan because of the mutual threat of these uh, troubling powers to the north in the Arab world. And it's, it's certainly extremely interesting for us to watch. And it's kind of fascinating also, Israel's reliance upon Egypt and their peace treaty with Egypt reflect something that has happened so many times in the past. And in Ezekiel chapter 29, we don't have time to go there now, but the context is, uh, has an application in the latter days. It says, And all the inhabitants of Egypt shall know that I am Yahweh because they have been a staff of reed to the house of Israel. They will disappoint Israel yet again as they have in the past. When they took hold of thee by the hand, thou didst break and rend their shoulder. And when they leaned upon thee, thou breakest and made all their loins to be at a stand or to tremble, as another translation says. And we know, of course, that the Saudis will be a part of the coalition that will challenge Gog's army somewhat weakly uh, in alliance with the Tarshish powers. Jordan themselves will be a place of refuge for, for the Jews fleeing from Gog's invasion, as Isaiah tells us in chapter 16. And so this is extremely interesting for us. The ruler in Saudi Arabia has recently um, authorised deals and talks with Israel, and a number of those have been had. Well, is Israel ready for their Messiah? I don't think there's much doubt, brethren and sisters, on that as a, as a people, the vast majority of them are not. They remain in unbelief of the Messiahship of Jesus. There are about 10,000, I believe, what they call Messianic Jews, which, who hold a, a, a hybrid of belief uh, of uh, some elements of Christianity and, and some of Judaism. They, they are looking for a Messiah. The Jews... The Orthodox Jews themselves, and, and there are some there, um, amongst them there is an expectation of the coming of Messiah. But what that actually means is very variable. But this one here that, that has been recently quoted uh, has been talking very clearly in recent times of the coming of the Messiah. And yet, brothers and sisters, it is not the Messiah that we understand. And so as a nation... No, they are not ready. But in the, in the purpose of God, yes, everything is ready. Everything is in place for the coming of the Messiah. Interestingly, these two passages both tell us that in the eyes of God, Israel, uh, he says in, in Zechariah 13, I will cut off the names of the idols out of that land and they shall be no more remembered. What, what idols are there? Well, any, and we know an idol is anything in which you put your trust. Look at this advertisement across the bottom of the screen there. Is that not an idol? Iron Dome. Is that not something in which they put their trust to save them? We believe so. And of course, Amos says in Amos chapter 6, 
ye which rejoice in a thing of naught and which say, Have we not taken to us horns by our own strength? He says, Behold, I will raise up, up against you a nation, O house of Israel, saith Yahweh of armies. They shall afflict you from the entering in of Hemath unto the river of the, of the wilderness. And so God will bring the mighty power of Gog down to humble his people because that is the final stage of getting them ready for their Messiah. And what about us, brethren and sisters? We know that our Lord said, when these things begin to come to pass, look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. He spake to them a parable, Behold the fig tree and all the trees, when they now shoot forth, ye see and know of your own selves that summer is now nigh at hand. So likewise ye, when ye see these things, Come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. What an exhortation for us, brethren and sisters. Let us make every effort that we can to be ready for that day. The Apostle Paul gives us a sobering exhortation in Romans chapter 11. He says, If the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? And he says in verses 20 and 21, Well, because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he spare not thee. So, brethren and sisters, let us all encourage one another to recognise the wonderful gift that God has given us in the hope of Israel. And let us exhort one another and so much the more as we see the day approaching.